What's up everyone, Conrad Newfelt here, and today, well today's a little bit different of a video than I would normally make. Today's video is for how to avoid first time home buyer mistakes. We're gonna talk about some of the main mistakes that people make. We're gonna go over Angela Pirelli's top five. And of course, to cover that, Angela Pirelli from EXP is here with us to cover those mistakes. Some of the big ones. Let's start with the very first one that I swear you run into, I run into all the time. People think they can go out and start looking before they get pre-approved for a mortgage. They'll call me up and they're like, well, I just kind of want to look. I want to see what I like before they have any idea what they can afford. We'll get people who jump in. They'll go, they'll find a house. And I, honestly, there are some very patient realtors. They'll go and show like 50 houses with a budget that they're not approved for. Then they'll go in and they'll be like, okay, great. Like, how do we get approved for this? I'm like, you know, we're close. <laughs> one time this guy who comes in and they did the right step they got pre-approved before house shopping and we're like you're pre-approved for like three hundred thousand. and then he's like oh, okay great and then he comes back and he's like i put an offer in a house awesome cool man that was the house comes across our desk and it's for four hundred fifty thousand. i'm oh, like whoa buddy no we told you three three hundred three fifty where did this 400 450 come from that doesn't make any sense and then he's like oh oh sorry sorry my bad my bad i thought the rental income would help reach the cap okay that's fair i understand it won't in this case but you know go back to the drawing board so they collapsed the deal a little while later he came back to me and he's like got a new place we checked the deal eight hundred thousand dollars i'm like you took that advice and you went right in the wrong direction with it like, you heard me but you didn't listen i always even if somebody messages me on off a sign like are you pre-approved you know if you can actually afford this house before we go and look at it and if they've been through the process they're like oh yeah for sure this is who i'm pre-approved through they have no problem telling you that great let's go look yeah. other people they take it as an insult they think that you are questioning whether or not yeah. i don't know it's some sort of personal element but they get mad they won't talk to you they tell you off they say the meanest things oh. i'm like okay move on you know it's it's funny because you're talking about that how you're like oh you should go get pre-approved and stuff like that yeah. but i mean we deal with it when we have to be the bearer of bad news in a lot of ways yeah. like hey you're not pre-approved for what you thought you were common things that we'll see is people will be like of course i'll get a mortgage right i mean three hundred thousand a year is like as a family right of course we'll get approved and then you find out that they've got like four hundred thousand dollars in debt and they're making eighteen thousand dollars a month worth in payment and like that's a real thing right like it you is. see that more often than you think so it's like hey so you know what are we pre-qualified for the starbucks coffee or people will be like oh of course i'm going to get approved and then it'll be like a farmers farmers are actually really common i broker nationally but in Saskatchewan, we'll look at the farmer who comes in. Of course, they should, you know, be qualified for the world and stuff like that because they have no debt, they have no whatever. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, what becomes the challenge? Well, their credit score because they don't have one because they have no debt. Because a credit score isn't an indication that you've handled your finances well. Ironically, a credit score is an indication of how well you've handled debt. And if you don't have debt, you don't have a credit score, and that becomes a big, significant challenge. And then there's all these extra things, and then they get, like you said, defensive and confrontational. Why can't I be approved? Why can't I whatever? Look how strong I am. And I'm like, well, that would make sense if lending was based on common sense unfortunately in today's world it's not like there's some things yeah. that just don't make sense they'll do this where they do get approved and then yeah. they change the underlying thing underneath that approval so they go and make large purchases or do something dumb people get so excited they get their offer on their house and all of a sudden they decide they want to go buy a vehicle and they go get this huge vehicle payment and then it screws everything up and we don't usually hear about it until all of a sudden you guys are pulling everything for possession day and you're like oh crap <laughs> You're calling us like, we don't know if this can happen. We used to have the 10 commandments of financing, the thou shall not. So thou shall not purchase a vehicle prior to possession date. I think what's funny is like a lot of people are like, are we approved? And they get that letter saying, yeah, you're approved. And they sign the commitment and everything's good to go. But what a lot of people don't realize is that that approval can change. If the underlying yeah. assumptions, if the underlying thing that was underwritten changes, mm -hmm. if you screw up your credit, you declare bankruptcy, you go into, mm -hmm. you, you become insolvent. If you, you know, rack up credit card bills, if you co-sign for loans, any, literally anything, you change yeah. Anything that, that was underwritten initially, it can just change everything. And people, they'll be like, well, how would they how would they know? They pull credit checks constantly on you throughout the process and before possession too. Mm -hmm. We had one where the lender pulled a credit check two days prior to possession and found something that just didn't even know about. The client didn't even let us know. And I, and I don't think that people understand how important that one is. Once you've removed your condition of finance, once mm -hmm. you've removed your conditions, you're contractually obligated. You're con you contractually bound to buy that place. So say that happens to somebody and all of a sudden they can't get their mortgage. They can't 
cannot complete, they are pretty much having to forego that down payment. So the work that they put into saving all yep. that, not the full down payment, the deposit, I should say. The deposit, yeah. So whether it's 5,000, 10,000, whatever it may be, they're probably losing out on that money. Plus they put themselves at risk of the seller suing them. Lots of time on the market, all those details. So it opens up a whole bag of issues. The seller needs their house sold in order for them to get the financing for yes. their place. Yep. So they're like, we're going to sue them for the damages. Because if we have to lose our deposit, we're going to sue you for our deposit too. The amount of damages that can go along is huge. The wildest one though, I'd have to say that we've ever had, they spent their down payment. That one, <laughs> that one blew my mind. Yeah, so they get, they get approved. So they get this, they get approved <laughs> 10 days prior to possession. You know, we send out our, you know, before the lawyer email kind of thing, like, Hey, this is what to expect. You're going to have to bring out like a, a bank draft for your, your lawyer or whatever for the remainder of your down payment. And I get a call and uh, the guy's like, Hey, what do you mean this bank draft for this down payment? I'm like, well, you know, like you had to show us and we told you to like, you know, show us your down payment, your 90 day history and stuff. And we told you to keep that aside and stuff like that. I'm like, well, now you're gonna have to get a bank draft to, to give it to your lawyer so they can give it to the seller. And he's like, oh, he's like, I thought once I showed it, I didn't need it anymore. Mm, no, like, what do you mean? What do you mean you don't need it anymore? And he's like, he's like, yeah, I thought once I showed it, I just you know, I could use it now. I'm like, okay, so are you telling me you don't have the down payment anymore? And he's like, no, man, I bought a trailer for my, I think it was a skidoo or something like that. He's like, so what do we do? Well, you go and sell the freaking trailer, man. <laughs> he's like, well, he's like, I might not get everything back though. I might not get, I'm like, wow, that's an expensive lesson. Trust me, you don't want all these other more expensive lessons. I learned this one in an interesting way. So years ago when all the Google assistants, Alexa's, all that kind of stuff started to come out, we were walking through a house and they had a little Google assistant sitting on the counter. And the client I was with worked in the technology industry. And as we're walking through, he said, Hey, Google, and Google answered. And he said, Are you recording? And Google said, Yes, I am. As we were walking through this house, so any conversation my buyers and I were having, Google was recording. So he specifically, he said, Google, stop recording. Google erased the last recording. So he took over and it listened to him in that seller's house. Oh. He asked it to erase, but it was, it was recording. Everybody's coming through. So if you're walking through a house and you're saying, I absolutely love this. I would pay anything for this. I will do whatever they want. You've given away your whole negotiating standpoint in the seller's house and they're listening to you. And the exact same thing happens with those doorbells because people think once they step out of the house that they're safe, but those doorbells, oh, yeah. it just saves clips. If it picks up motion, it saves the clip. So even if right. they're not yeah. intentionally recording you. So you can even, you can even claim like you didn't have any intent. It just does that thing when you walk. 100%. Yeah. Oh. Oh, geez. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it changes the things a little bit. Like there was one situation, I was at a conference where again, tech guy came up and he said that some kids have been messing around with fences and stuff in the neighborhood. So he pulled the video footage from his camera and he said, even though you can see them, you could hear the kids down the block to the point that they recognize the voices and were able to catch every single kid. So even when you leave the house, you're walking out your car, if you're discussing your thoughts on that house, those sellers get that all on recording. And yet- So what do, you, what do you do then? I usually tell people, I give them a heads up before we ever go out. I give them the story of the one that I walked through with the Google Assistant. I tell them about the doorbells. And I said, honestly, like we can discuss the house while we're in there, but we're not going to discuss how much you love it or kind of what your overall thoughts are on it. That way you can ask me questions. We can make observations that are general, but any discussion beyond that, we're either having somewhere else completely, we'll go for coffee or we'll hop mm -hmm. on a call later on. It's that much of a concern that you're actively forewarning client to like watch your conversation because it can 100%. be recording. And I mean, people get a little bit indignant or, you know, not wanting to be recorded but it's not like it's being invasive. You're going into their house. What can you do about it? You just watch well, it. Even, even I have to admit, I would be damn curious if someone was walking through my house, like what they're doing. I mean, I've heard some stories about people doing some truly bizarre, weird things inside of other people's houses when they think they're alone. In fact, I think there was a, there was a stat. Oh yeah. So 15% of Americans, here it is. 15% of Americans who have sold their home said they actively use security systems to monitor potential buyers. Meanwhile, 67% said that if they were selling their home today and had such devices, they'd switch them on when, when buyers come calling. And I mean, whether or not they do go back and listen to it, I don't know, but they do have, they do I mean, have If I can get an extra $10,000 on my house, because I heard some schmuck talking about my house. Some buyers come into town. They're in town for a weekend. You show them anywhere from 20 to 40 houses in one weekend. Like you just go, go, go. So yeah. your timing has to be specific. You're scheduling around your drive time, your sellers, everything else. And all of a sudden you pull up to a house and they're like, no, we don't like the neighborhood. Or no, we don't like the look of it. And they don't oh, even go inside. Sense. 
right? You've kicked down the seller who might have kids, everything else. So one of my things when I talk to buyers now is if you don't know the neighborhoods, you need to go start driving around, checking them out. If a house pops up in a neighborhood that you're unsure of, I want you to drive by the house before we book a showing. Certain neighborhoods, you have to check out almost every house first, because if it's in a good block, you're great. Mm -hmm. If it's a bad block, you might want to avoid it. It just eliminates the time waste. Question for you then. Let's say that, you know, you're getting someone from out of town who's coming yeah. in to buy. How do you prep them for the neighborhood then? Or do you like get them to fill out a questionnaire? In a <laughs> conversation, yeah. I'm like, okay, so if they are the kind of, you know, there's a lot of kind of young hip couples that come in, they want the little retrofit neighborhoods. They want to get into Riversdale and stuff like that. I'm oh, like, yeah, okay, yeah. I know the neighborhoods you want, but are you comfortable getting into a house on a block where there's going to be needles in your backyard, in your front yard, people are going to be passed out in your yard. Or do you want to get into a block where most of the houses are owner occupied, have been turned over a little more, and you're probably going to have some transient element walking by, you might end up with someone in your, but it's not as likely. What is your comfort level? And if they say, well, we're comfortable with all of it. Okay, great. I'll show them whatever comes up that they like. If they kind of have that pick and choose, I will actually do a drive by on the block. Oh, interesting. Before. And you like video it. And I mean, if they're looking more at suburban neighborhoods, then you can get a pretty good idea for what they like on a situation like that if they're just coming into town I might take the morning the first morning to like get them a snapshot of a few different neighborhoods we'll look at a house in a couple different areas and then from there we kind of tweak it down this isn't necessarily related to this but it kind of still is virtual tours man I could have swore like five mm -hmm. years ago when it's like you can walk 3d through all these houses I used to think I'm like man this is it realtors are going to be gone in five years because mm -hmm. you're just going to be able to sit on your butt eating cheesies you know just yep. oh i like that bedroom right but clearly that hasn't happened even yep. with covid that hasn't happened so do you ever utilize those yeah i do i actually do all of it so for most of my listings i do a 3d scan where they can they can do that tour where they stop and that's the one where you can like walk into a room you can look up you can look down you have control over how you're moving through the house okay. on some of the higher end listings i do like the really fancy video walkthrough and then on really? um, most of my other listings i will still do my own walkthrough sometimes it's just a reel that's really quick sometimes Sometimes I slow it down and almost do like my own little virtual open house where I'll kind of talk people through, walk them through everything. And then other buyers I do, I will do a virtual walkthrough before they come into town. Like we'll actually all head to the house, walk them through a few different houses before they actually get here to decide what they want to go into. And then do you include the neighborhood as, as part of that thing? You know, I haven't done a full neighborhood with the walking. Like I'll still tell them to check out the Google Earth. Go know. street view and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's still just so different though, because even with Matterport, so with Matterport one, it's a super expensive camera. But That's that big hunky big box thingy right yeah it is. but then if you really really want to get into things with that camera you can go put on a virtual headset you can get your client to stand in the house and walk through the room while they're in the virtual headset. And so I've tried that too, but it's still not the same experience as standing in the house. Like it's got those options. It's just not quite the same though. Nothing feels the same as getting in there and seeing it in person still. So you basically only use it if it was long distance clients, like someone yeah. going from city to city kind of thing. If like you're in the city, yeah. you're going to go get them to experience yeah. the neighborhood, go get them to experience They're the house. Great tools. But okay. So say I went to buy a house in Toronto, I would do all of that pre, mm -hmm. but I would still not buy a house without going and physically walking through it so there you go it's as great as technology is yeah. you'll still do the the, the manual <laughs> stuff which makes sense this and one I comes into play on the buying and the selling side people listening to their friends over their agent so on the buying side what i found especially in market like we just saw january to about july it's still a busy market out there but those months were crazy again it was back into like really 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 high intense bidding wars you had to be out there in the first few hours get your offer in bid over list like minimal conditions on your offers and there are some people that will listen to their friends and they're like oh no my friend has always told me i should never pay over list on a house and it's like oh really has your friend <laughs> yeah. been around for the last couple of months have they just been out to 40 different houses where every single house went thirty thousand over list my favorite is the mom and the dad usually are the ones the, the coaching yeah. and, and this is what i struggle with i know the advice that they're trying to give is out of goodness yes. they're trying oh, to protect their kid they're trying to do all yeah. like, i understand it's coming from a good place but for them to not realize that buying a home now is not the same as buying a home in the 80s let alone like last year uh, i don't know it's yeah i struggle with that to this like even this week actually it happened this week where this was mortgage related but mom was was very opinionated as to what her daughter should be and should not be signing i mean i felt bad for her because she just was anxious to all hell like physically anxious over this she's like asking about all the different like options and stuff like that and we walked her through all of those article after article after article basically showing that you know mom is wrong here but <laughs> despite that your mom is pushing like this is wrong and not in like 
like a I'm right, you're wrong kind of situation. Like, let's just look at this logically. The outcome is going to be if you make these decisions. And not only can you know that to be like true theoretically, you can see it practically as well. Because look at all these use cases. Look at all these testimonies that have said, if you do this, this does happen. And, you know, at the end of the day, mom still won. The, the conversation I had with her is I'm like, look, it, regardless, it's going to be okay to some degree. You might just not be as good or as best off. And, and sometimes it can really, really hurt. But I was like, I want you to know you can always come back and we can always have a conversation. And I will never, ever tell you, I told you so. But I'm telling you in advance. It does have to be handled delicately, hey, especially when you're dealing with parents, because people very much want to please their parents still, which is just human nature. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah and with friends too. And sometimes that's the only way you can do. You can give them all the information, you can show them the stats, but until they've been through it a few times and possibly lost out on two or three homes, they don't necessarily start to learn, oh, maybe you actually know what you're talking about. Or parents being like, if you want the house, you got to do like an unconditional offer. It's like, that's so dangerous. Yes. It's oh, like, totally. Yeah, it's... Yeah, I've just seen some of like, like I said, in Ontario, we've heard it before. Yeah. Where it's like, oh, you got to put in an unconditional offer. I'm like, you should never, unless you can buy that thing 100% cash and you're prepared to buy something with potentially lots of problems because mm -hmm. you're skipping the home inspection too. Yeah. There's so many things that could go wrong if you're listening to the wrong person's advice. Yeah, and like you said, with the home condition stuff too, we didn't get as much of that this year. There were definitely home selling with no conditions. There were still other ones that did have them attached, which was good. But I've always told buyers that too. I'm like, unless you are a contractor, that can go in and fix anything that comes up that could be wrong with the house and you literally have all the cash you should never go in unconditionally. yeah like even then because there's the financing and there's the home inspection side of it and stuff like that let's let's say there's a home buyer out there watching this video in the future what would be your number one what's your number one takeaway the number one takeaway is always go make sure you have a good solid pre-approval make sure mm -hmm. even if you got it a long time ago make sure it's still current get all that in place and then from there lots of conversations with your realtor with your mortgage broker and just keep the communication open it's way easier to put together a purchase when someone has done their stuff correctly from the start instead of guessing. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I appreciate you coming on board for this. I'm going to definitely have you on again in the future. Thanks a lot. Sounds good. Thanks, Conrad.